So hello and uh, welcome to our discussion and demonstration, embroidery and design, the art of Chinese opera costumes. I'm David Uy with the Chinese American Museum. Uh, we are the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. Uh, our show this evening is made possible through the generous support of AARP Maryland, and we thank them for all they do for the museum and our programs. So not only is this a very interesting topic, uh, we're, we're excited because we're breaking out of our normal webinar format to do a little walking tour, uh, detailing some of the amazing costumes in our recent exhibit, Golden Threads, Chinese Opera in America. And also good news, uh, that exhibit has been extended uh, to January 22nd. So uh, please come uh, if you're in the area and, and, and come by and see that. <clears throat> so at any time you could submit your questions or comments using the chat feature in your Zoom window. Uh, we'll do our best to get to your submissions um, and that will probably be in the latter part of our discussion. So this event's being recorded and the discussion portion will be on our YouTube channel in a day or so. So um, you could also find this right now uh, streaming live on Facebook. So we, I think I mentioned this uh, on the audio, um, we recommend that you use gallery view instead of speaker view. And that's usually found on the top right corner of your Zoom app. So, so tonight we are joined by two amazing guests. Uh, first, our good friend Lee Talbert is curator at the George Washington University Museum, Museum the Textile Museum. And uh, he specializes in East Asian textile history and is a lecturer with GW's art history program. Most recently, uh, Lee curated the exhibition Vanishing Traditions, Textiles and Treasures from Southwest China. He also lent his expertise to our Golden Threads exhibit and is, uh, was a big help in, in getting that launched. So Lee is, uh, he was previously curator at the Chungyung Yang Embroidery Museum in uh, Seoul, Korea. Uh, he serves on the board of the Textile Society of America and he's the editor, uh, he's on the editorial board of Textile, the Journal of Cloth and Culture. Also joining us tonight, uh, Dr. April Liu is an independent curator and cultural programmer based in Vancouver and Lima. That's a long commute. She has organized numerous festivals, exhibitions, and cultural initiatives across North America, Asia, and South America. Uh, she served as the curator of public programs and engagement at the University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology. And she also served as an expert consultant for UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage section on Asia. She's a specialist in Asian art history, and she recently authored Divine Threads, the visual and material culture of Cantonese opera. And we'll provide information about that book uh, at the end of our program. So uh, thank you for joining us. All right, thanks so much, David. I'm really excited to be here for this special viewing of Chinese opera costumes. Today, I'm going to be providing comments about the materials, uh, the techniques, um, the designs that we see on these costumes. Of course, the, for the clothes we wear every day, uh, the materials, the designs, the techniques give information about our identity. Uh, we can express our, uh, our gender, our socioeconomic class, um, our ethnicity, um, our personal taste, all of that through the clothes that we wear. And the more that we know about a particular culture or a particular group, the more we can pick up on the visual cues that its members are giving out through their clothing. Um, the costumes that we'll see today mostly date to the 20th century, uh, but the vocabulary of materials, techniques, and designs date back to China's Ming and Qing dynasties. So Ming dynasties 1368 to 1644 and Qing dynasties 1644 to 1912. And so today we'll be talking about these visual cues that uh, opera goers would have understood and they would have used to recognize uh, the identity of the particular wearers. 
Um, the most basic element of the costume is, of course, the material. Textiles, I mean, uh, costumes are usually made of textiles, and textiles are made of fibers. Uh, fibers can be uh, from plants, such as cotton or hemp, or they can be from animals, um, such as wool from sheep, or silk from various types of moths. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, the uh, uh, invention of sericulture, which is of raising silkworms and silk weaving, was an invention of China that had a tremendous impact on Chinese history and culture, um, and indeed uh, on the whole world. Um, sericulture, or the, the secret of making silk, was a Chinese secret that was closely guarded for centuries, and anyone who shared that secret with outsiders uh, would have been executed. Um, uh, silk was the most highly valued um, material in China, and for centuries, only the ruling class um, were allowed to wear silk. But it wasn't just for clothing. Um, in dynastic China, silk for, uh, was a kind of a currency. It was like money. You could buy goods, you could pay your taxes in silk. So viewers of silk uh, would have appreciated its beauty, but they also would have been aware um, of these many layers of meaning attached to silk. And many of the silks we'll see today are embroidered. Um, and what do I mean by embroidery? Embroidery is using a needle and thread and stitching a design into a fabric that's already been woven. Um, embroidery has no practical function. It is just for beauty or to communicate certain um, ideas or messages uh, through, through your clothing. Um, it's extremely time consuming to produce. Uh, and so for much of Chinese history, embroidery was associated with wealth and high status. Um, embroidery is one of China's very oldest art forms. The history of embroidery goes way back into prehistory. And it probably stems actually from tattooing. Um, scholars believe that uh, you know, early uh, people of prehistoric China, uh, we know that they tattooed their bodies in patterns. And these patterns probably communicated ideas about their identity, personal identity, group identity, um, their prestige, or they were meant to attract uh, the good, repel evil. Um, over time, these designs moved from the skin, from their body, onto leather garments, and designs would have been stitched on in shells, stones, and other kind of ornaments. And then with the event, uh, invention of weaving and sericulture, um, these uh, developed into the sophisticated art of silk embroidery. Um, so I've told you a little bit about uh, the materials, the techniques, and we'll be talking more about the history of these, significance of these as we go along. But I think now April's gonna tell us a little bit more about these as costumes. Thank you, Lee. I'm gonna share a screen here. I have a little introduction on Beijing Opera. Um, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see my screen there. And thank you to the Chinese American Museum for hosting this wonderful event. Honored to be here. So the costumes we're looking at today are from Beijing Opera. Now, what is Beijing Opera? I'm gonna just share just a few minutes uh, of introduction on this topic. Jingju, it's the Chinese term for Beijing Opera, it means opera of the capital. And it is one of more than 300 types of traditional Chinese opera. It has been recognized by UNESCO for its global significance as an item of intangible cultural heritage for humanity. And traditional Chinese opera, or Xi uh, is the larger umbrella term for, for Chinese opera. It's actually better, probably better translated as musical theater rather than using the English term opera, which tends to call up Western operatic traditions that are quite different. In China, musical theater has very deep roots going back to at least the third century BC. During the late 18th and 19th centuries, this is when Beijing opera took shape as a unique tradition that had the patronage of the Qing court. It reflected an amalgam of different cultural, musical, and theatrical influences from different parts of China. And it's important to note that Chinese musical theater was and continues to be an extremely diverse and vibrant art form with many regional variations. And it's deeply steeped in the spiritual and ritual cultures of China. It is performed in village festivals, in temples, in tea houses and opera theaters. And the performances are considered highly auspicious. So they're often performed for deities on their birthdays or for special festivals of the Lunar New Year calendar. Beijing opera features singing, dancing, 
live music, martial arts, mining, acrobatics, and elaborate costuming. The traditional costumes are reminiscent of the Ming Dynasty, an earlier period, although these dramas can take place throughout many different time periods, so they're an anachronistic. The stories draw on the well-known tales of Chinese history, legend, and myth, and many of the same classic tales are performed over and over. Now, this is because the story is not the main focal point of the opera. For its seasoned viewers, they already know the stories inside out. The main focus is the performer's mastery of the embodied art form. Simply put, Beijing opera is an embodied and stylized art form that highlights transformation. The performers undergo years of rigorous training to master the transformation of their bodies, the precise singing techniques, the dancing and acrobatic fighting techniques, the use of costumes and props. And as you can see here, the stage is often quite bare and minimal because the focus is on the performers. And to transform the stage into a scene in the mind's eye of the viewer, the performers use mind gestures and just a few simple props to convey things such as riding a horse into battle or charging through a snowstorm. Stylized and mime gestures are extremely important as a condensed form of dramatic storytelling. In addition, the colors, patterns, and visual designs of the costumes and makeup also convey deep layers of meaning about the characters' personalities, their emotional states, even their moral values. As the scenes unfold, live musicians are playing traditional instruments in perfect sync with the performer's movements. Now this requires a great deal of perfect timing and improvisation during the performance. Now seasoned opera viewers, they're well-versed in all of these codes of these embodied performances and the masterful execution of these techniques on stage is the main attraction of the opera. Beijing, in Beijing opera, the roles are standardized into set categories and the performers, they have to specialize in specific roles because just learning one role can take years, even a lifetime. Now, at a glance, the stylized costume and makeup will immediately communicate what type of character is on stage, including their age, their gender, their social status. This is not a comprehensive list here, but just a quick overview of the four major role types in Beijing opera. And each of these role types have subsets uh, based on age and personality, but I'm just gonna give you a quick view of these. So the first one is the Shen, the male role types, which could be the younger male, the elder male, or the martial male. One of the most famous being the monkey king there, the martial male role there on the right. Second, we have the Dan, the female role types, which could be the younger unmarried maiden, the mature married woman, the elder woman or the martial woman warrior. And we have, we're gonna show an extraordinary costume of the warrior, woman warrior. Third, we have the jing, jing, the painted face male role types. And these can be upright with the red face or they can be villainous with the white face. So color symbolism is very important. And finally, we have the to, the comic role types, which uh, loosely categorized as either the civil or the martial. Um, and those are different skill sets as well as different costumes. So that's just a quick uh, overview of what is Beijing opera before we get into the costumes. And what's exciting is that we have, uh, we have costumes for every role type that we're gonna look at today. <laughs> I'll hand it over to you, Lee. <laughs> All right, thank you. So April, anytime, uh, just, just jump in. Um, the first one at first glance looks a little bit plain, but I'm gonna, focus mostly on the silk. Um, and as I talked about silk being one of the great inventions of China, silk is soft and lustrous like no other fabric. Um, this, the ground fabric, not the blue embroidery, we're talking about the, this off-white ground fabric, it's all woven in one color, uh, but the weaving technique takes advantage of the directionality of weaving to create this pattern. And this is a type of fabric that's called damask. Um, it has a very long history in China. Um, it's made since uh, at least the Shang Dynasty, so the second millennium BC. Um, and it creates patterns by, um, you have the uh, warp and the weft. The warp are the threads that go uh, vertically and weft is horizontally. Um, these shiny areas of pattern, uh, the warp is actually floating over the wefts in these areas um, and it catches the light. Um, and so even though there's only one color, 
um, by catching the light, these warp floats are creating these um, beautiful patterns. Um, we can get this kind of soft and uh, lustrous silk um, through sericulture, as I said, and the Chinese invented during the Neolithic time, um, uh, this method, uh, they actually selectively bred wild silkworms, and then they uh, uh, discovered that they could, um, if they actually kill the silkworm uh, before it comes out as a moth, they can get one continuous fiber, because when the silkworm spins its cocoon, <clears throat> it spins one fiber that's about half a mile long. Um, if you let it live its life and it comes out as a moth, it breaks those fibers and you have to spin them. Um, so by killing the, uh, the silkworm, you can get these very long, lustrous fibers. So we should keep in mind that like a, a, a garment like this, many hundreds, if not many thousands of silkworms had to give up their lives <laughs> to, to create these, these. And so it's this knowledge, this embodied knowledge of these many, many millennia um, uh, of Chinese knowledge of sericulture uh, that we see in every one of these costumes. Um, this one is embellished with embroidery. Um, like I mentioned, embroidery was expensive. Um, and so uh, adding embroidery to this already beautifully patterned uh, 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 silk is enhancing its value. We'll see that this is relatively plain. If you look in the flowers, for example, um, the areas between the individual petals, you just see the ground fabric, uh, this damask fabric. Um, and we're gonna see that's a little bit different in some of the fancier costumes. That's right. So we're going from the lower ranking costumes to the higher ranking costumes and it's going to get progressively more ornate. So this one is for a lower ranking martial character. And the way we can tell is the tight sleeves. Yeah, let's go back to that white one. The tight sleeves, the tight collar, um, the, the, the short pants. Nothing's flowy because if you're going to do acrobatics and fighting, you can't have too much fabric flying around. So this would have been worn by a foot soldier, a guard, or a sedan carrier. You can see the banner in the background. In a battle scene, the, the soldiers would come out carrying the banners and then behind them would come the generals. Uh, we know it's lower rank because the embroidery is just limited to the edge. Later on, we'll see where the embroidery spreads over the entire costume and that's reserved only for higher ranking characters. All right, let's go on and look at this garment and I will wait for April to tell us exactly you know, who or uh, uh, what kind of character would have worn it. But there's a couple of things that I can say about it. Um, now that you know about damask, you can recognize that this is damask as well. Um, the ground fabric only has one color, it's brown, uh, but the weaving takes advantage of this directionality and the sheen of uh, silk to create these, what I think they look like to me, orchid patterns. Um, this is very plain, there's no embroidery on it. And so um, April will explain more a little bit about that. Um, what interests me about this as a, a costume historian is uh, the shape like, uh, of the neck, the neck opening and these wide sleeves. Um, this is a Ming Dynasty style. Um, so you have to remember uh, when uh, this would have been made, well, this might've been made 20th century after the Ming, uh, after the Qin, but anyway, um, this style was not worn anymore by the Chinese people during the Qing dynasty. Um, when the uh, Manchu people, um, uh, which is a, a northern tribe group, took over, conquered China, uh, uh, deposed the Ming in 1644, um, they imposed their own native dress on, uh, on many of the people, uh, particularly the men and the men in the government service. Uh, the Manchu people were horse riding people. Um, they tended to wear tighter fitting clothes uh, with, um, with these very uh, narrow sleeves. Uh, the Ming had much more wide and, and kind of flowing um, garments uh, like we see here. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, of nationalism here. Um, and I think that um, April will be able to talk about that. Um, the people are not wearing these, um, but they're looking back wistfully at this time. And by wearing these kind of garments, you know, they're asserting their Chinese, their Han Chinese, ethnic Chinese identity. That's absolutely right, Lee. And what I find so fascinating is that the Manchu court actually were patrons for this. And they also, you could 
think of it as a way of um, showing their Chineseness as well as the proper virtuous rulers of China. <laughs> so kind of appropriating it for their own agenda, whereas performers, uh, of course, are celebrating Han identity, like you said. So it's amazing how in the arts, it allows that fluidity of, of both subversion and appropriation to happen. Um, and like you said, this, this costume is a more plain. So we don't see the embroidery. This color brown is usually reserved for uh, lower ranking characters. The loose sleeves, as opposed to the tight ones, this means this is a non-martial character. So worn in a non-martial setting, likely by a, like a character such as a villager or a servant, or maybe an older person living away from worldly concerns in the countryside. Uh, so that's the type of character that would have worn this, this costume. All right, thank you. Um, the next one also, um, we see this Ming style neck opening, these wide sleeves, um, this uh, hat style, which also harkens back to the Ming. Um, on this neck opening, um, we see um, sequins embroidered on here, which are actually not very common um, in Chinese embroidery, but I can imagine that for the stage, they would be wonderful because of all of this light uh, reflectivity. Um, but the pattern that they're in, this kind of uh, meander pattern, um, harkens back to the Thunderline pattern, which is an ancient pattern. It goes uh, at least all the way back to uh, the Shang Dynasty. So it's, it's making these references to, to very old Chinese culture. Another cultural reference we see in the embroidery, um, which is at the bottom along the hem. Um, now, this is actually a man's costume, but um, in uh, traditional China, Ming and Qing China, we usually don't see embroidered flowers on men's costume. That uh, was relatively unusual, but we do see that here. Um, and the flower is actually an orchid. Um, the flowers had lots of symbolic associations that people would have seen and understood. Um, orchids were a prominent symbols of scholars, of scholar officials. Um, and particularly they uh, symbolize scholars whose, um, whose virtue, uh, whose intellect were under recognized by the powers that be. Um, so orchids held a very strong place um, in, the, uh, uh, in the world of these scholar officials. So who were the scholar officials? Well, you know, as early as the fourth century BC, um, writers were talking about a hierarchy in Chinese culture um, with the uh, Chinese society. Um, with the scholars at the top, then the farmers, uh, then um, the uh, artisans, craftsmen, and then at the bottom, the merchants. Um, and so scholars had a very exalted position in uh, China uh, for, for millennia. That's right, Lee. And, and in the opera, many of the stories about, are about scholars, uh, their trials and tribulations in life, trying to rise in rank, trying to win the woman, the beautiful woman uh, of their, their hearts. Uh, this particular costume, uh, by looking at the design, the simple design would have been for a lower ranking male scholar. Uh, the scholar's cap is very characteristic. It has those two, um, like almost like mushroom cloud designs off to the side. Uh, those are called Rui. Uh, they're the uh, longevity fungus design that's been very stylized and is again associated with the scholar. Um, and like Lee said, the, the flowers embroidered at the bottom are all, definitely a sign of the, the scholar. Uh, flowers that, um, uh, spring flowers also are associated with, with uh, scholars um, and bamboo, uh, things that survive in the snow, a sign of virtue and determination, perseverance against pressures. Uh, here, the pink color is very interesting. Uh, the pink color is often reserved in the opera for a romantic figure, a poet, a lover, maybe a suitor for a beautiful maiden. Um, and I wanted to say something about those sequins. Now, ref reflectivity is extremely important in the opera, especially back in the day when we didn't have electrical lighting for the stage. It was performed by lantern. And anything that can catch the light would have just been magical on stage, catching shadows and flashes of light here and there. Before there were sequins, they actually sewed mirrors onto the costumes, but those were extremely heavy. So in the 20s and 30s, when sequins were starting to be developed, they were extremely popular with the, with the opera crowd and used on, on the costumes. Uh, so, so yes, the, this, uh, the, the silk it, itself um, actually amplifies the reflectivity. It's, it's a very reflective fabric. 
And it's not only lightweight and reflective, it's also extremely strong in tensile strength. So for the opera, that serves a very practical purpose. If you're dancing around and doing acrobatics, you don't want it to tear. <laughs> so it was for both practical reasons and also symbolic reasons as a divine textile, uh, as something that you would see in temples as, as an offering to the deities to drape the performers and the entire stage in silk is just this beautiful uh, offering to the gods of light and beauty. And also of course, to the human audiences to bring prosperity and auspiciousness. Yeah, thank you. Wow, that's fascinating. And yes, um, you brought up the point that silk is incredibly strong. Silk is actually the strongest natural fiber and has an incredibly high tensile strength. Um, so it's not only beautiful and lustrous, but it's also very strong. Uh, next, we're going to talk about this robe, which is um, heavily embroidered. Um, and this one is embroidered all over with flowers. Um, we did see some flowers on the man's robe, but in traditional, in Mingqing China, we usually associate uh, flower designs on costumes with females. Um, and as we saw with the orchid, you know, the different kinds of flowers would have symbolic associations. And so people would be able to um, see like, for example, peonies and peonies are fu hui hua, uh, the, the, the flower of wealth and rank or wealth and honor. And so uh, people would have brought those associations to, um, uh, uh, to their viewing of these pieces. Um, we're looking at a detail you can see of one of the flowers. Um, and this is done in one of the most basic stitches. It's called satin stitch. Um, and basically you, know, you come up on one side of the fabric and carry over uh, all the way across uh, the motif. Um, and it is a quick way to cover a lot of, um, to cover a lot of uh, surface on the fabric. But here you can see there's a blending of colors as well between uh, the motifs, uh, 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 between the areas on the particular flower petals. Um, so uh, with long and short stitches and satin stitches, you can create this kind of color blending. Um, and that's part of the art of embroidery um, that we see that we see on here. Um, you know, there's plenty of embroidery hobbyists, but most of us um, are not embroiderers. You have to do it for a while. Uh, and you can really truly understand how difficult and how long it is. And so to uh, create this heavy embroidery, on a garment like this, you know, we're looking at many hundreds of hours of skilled labor. So there is a lot of love and thought and labor uh, that goes into the creation of these costumes. Yes, and now we can see how that embroidery is spreading over the surface of the costume, indicating right away to a viewer that this is somebody of higher rank. Uh, this is likely uh, the, the costume for a higher ranking female in an informal setting, such as at home um, with the family. Uh, it's like that the blue color is, a, is indicative of uh, somebody of virtue, but also somebody with a fairly strong character, somebody who has got determination and perseverance, somebody with a bit of seriousness, <laughs> not a frivolous character. Um, also, you'll notice the long sleeves. These are called water sleeves. And they're very important in Beijing opera for the gestural performances that the females master. There's literally hundreds of gestures done with the water sleeves to indicate bashfulness, covering the face, peeking at, you know, a, a man perhaps <laughs> that one has interest in, or, you know, excitement or anxiety or surprise um, or for dancing. So it has many, many uses, the water sleeves. But it, a lot of these costumes are designed as extensions of the human body to extend your physical presence on stage. So this is another uh, evolution in Chinese opera that I find very interesting is that back in the day, <laughs> people would crowd around the stage and if you're in the back, you can't see very well what's happening on stage. The costumes by extending the human body, like say through these long sleeves, allow the performers to telegraph to audience members far away, everything that's happening. Um, and as we see more costumes, we'll see this is a, a trend um, moving forward. Um, but here, this costume, we're only looking at half of the costume. This is the upper portion. Uh, it would have been worn with a skirt, which is not shown here. Uh, so, so that's something to keep in mind, that a full costume, to fully understand who the character is, we need to see the makeup, the headdress, the accessories, the skirt, all of those elements. 
All right, thank you, April. <clears throat> and now we're moving on to this piece, um, which uh, one of the main um, features of this is the rank badge that it has in the center. In Ming and Qing, China, the government was a pyramidical uh, hierarchy. The emperor was at the top, <clears throat> and then below him uh, was, were nine ranks of civil officials and nine ranks of military officials. And <clears throat> the civil officials, each rank, um, was identified by a bird, and the military, each rank, was identified by an animal. Um, <clears throat> and so you would immediately know by looking at a person and seeing the animal that they're wearing what their rank was. So you'd know how to treat them, how, what language to use, how to address them. Um, so this is obviously an official. Um, what's interesting about this is that um, often, you know, these are created for the stage, but I have examined this rank badge it's actually a real rank badge from the Qing dynasty. It is not a stage prop. But of course, this was probably this costume was probably made in the 20th century. Um, the Qing dynasty fell in 1912. And so these badges no longer had any use. So it was probably quicker for them just to use an actual rank badge than to uh, recreate one. Um, this one is done in a very fine stitch. If you can go in and see it, it's, uh, it's uh, a stitch on gauze, it's counted stitch. And specifically, it's a brick stitch um, that's done on gauze. Um, so it's trans you can see through uh, to the base fabric. Um, this is very time consuming to produce. Um, the bird pattern that you see on here is interesting because it is detachable. Uh, and that tells us that it comes from the very end of the Qing dynasty. Uh, when the dynasty was very stable, um, you would have be stable in your job and you would have a bird or an animal and you might expect to keep your job for quite some time. And so you didn't need to change it. Um, in the chaos of the late Ming dynasty, uh, I mean, sorry, the late Qing dynasty, um, you might change your rank so often that you didn't want a badge that only had one animal on it. You wanted to be able to change that animal um, fairly quickly. So this one actually has a detachable bird on it. Um, the style of this is very much Qing. It's a Qing dynasty style, but the robe itself, the tailoring um, is Ming. And a Ming uh, uh, official would have worn a red robe like this because red was the dynastic color of the Ming dynasty. Um, very quickly, the hat, the hat is also a type that would have been worn by Ming officials. It has these two projections. Um, interestingly, many centuries before the Ming Dynasty, this actually started as a kind of turban, a head wrap, and these would have been the, uh, you know, the, the ends that would have stuck out. But during the Ming Dynasty, uh, they were usually made of gauze that's covered in lacquer. Yes, in, a, in Beijing Opera, this would have been the costume for a lower or mid-ranking civil official. And that's an, an incredible discovery about the rank badge, Lee. <laughs> and, before uh, the fall of the Qing, it was illegal to use real, uh, you know, official costumes in the opera. So they had to alter them to, so that they, you know, could tell the difference. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, now, red in the opera is a very powerful color. It's one of the main colors of uh, loyalty, integrity, power. Uh, it's worn by important characters. And if you uh, remember, we looked at some of the, the costumes for the, the villager or the, the, the scholar. Now, in many of the stories, the scholar goes out on a heroic journey uh, to conquer enemies or to overcome, you know, some major life challenge, and then comes, becomes um, an official, you know, becomes recognized for his talents and promoted and comes back to his village with success and wealth and riches. And that's a very common storyline. So, uh, the same character could have first appeared in, you know, the, the, the earlier costume of a scholar or a villager, and then in later scenes appear in this costume as a recognized official um, riding a horse uh, with this beautiful headdress. All right, thanks. So as we go along, they're getting more and more heavily embellished. Um, this one is a, a woman's robe. I'm sure April will tell us more about that. Um, but what we see um, is a stylized bird, a fantastical bird, um, that often in English we translate as a as phoenix. Um, fantastical birds with these lavish plumage, um, these are seen in some of the earliest uh, surviving embroideries from China. 
um, from Mashan tomb one, which is a fourth to third century BC uh, a tomb, a woman's tomb um, that was excavated. We find lots of these fantastical bird patterns. Um, and then in later centuries, we hear these legends about a bird called a Feng Huang, which had this very um, uh, lavish plumage um, and, uh, and many positive connotations, many legends built up around that. Um, over time, uh, the, this uh, Feng Huang, um, which before was shown as a male and female, um, it started to be paired with the dragon. And so uh, it was uh, symbolizing the yin of the yin and yang force um, uh, as opposed to the dragon, which was the yang. Um, on the bottom here, we see uh, a kind of design that we would usually see on imperial costumes from the Ming and Qing dynasties. Um, and this is ocean waves. Um, so the, uh, the patterns like we see here are the deep water, the standing, and then uh, the, the rounded uh, semicircles. These are the more frothy uh, waves on the top. Um, and then we see a sun rising out of the water. Um, and that's, you usually don't see that on imperial robes, but it has these very positive connotations. The rising sun um, is actually forms a rebus um, and it is uh, wishes for rising up in rank. Mm -hmm. This is such a beautiful piece. It's so ornate. And as now you can start to see how the high ranking costumes really stand out from the lower ranking ones. Uh, this one would have been for a higher ranking female uh, in, a, in a civil setting or a ceremonial court setting. It has the water sleeves. It has that ornate collar with the tassels. It would have been worn with a pleated skirt uh, likely with many layers and pleats with, with similar design um, and a belt and a beautiful headdress. Um, as uh, Lee was alluding to here, this amazing diagram of the phoenix and the sun and the water embroidered on, it's actually a, a cosmic diagram. The phoenix being a divine image of the feminine divine in the sky uh, coming into contact with the earth represented by the ocean waters. And then you have this cosmic sun in the middle. So it's this beautiful indication that this, this person, this character has uh, uh, a connection to earth and to heaven. And uh, later we're gonna see uh, the, the male version of this, the dragon robe that has a similar message. So this is the female version. Yeah, so let's go on and look at the dragon robes. We actually have two examples um, here. Um, with these beautiful red backgrounds and these large dragons um, and uh, front facing dragon in the middle and these two side facing dragons here. Of course, dragons um, over the centuries have become uh, almost a symbol of China itself. It's an extremely old uh, motif and some of the oldest embroideries that we have um, do have these fantastic creatures that look like um, what we think may be dragons. Um, from a very early period, um, dragons were associated with water, clouds, and rainfall. And these are extremely important. Um, China was um, overwhelmingly an agricultural country. Um, most people were farmers, and so water, rainfall, this was extremely important to them. And the dragon was seen as controlling the rainfall. Um, so it's a good, like, whereas in the West, the dragon is often, you know, we fear a dragon, but to them, uh, it's powerful, but beneficent. Um, and over time, uh, the dragon started to be associated with the ruler, and it also uh, started to be associated with the yang principle, and the yin and yang. Uh, yang is the male, um, it's the, uh, the, 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 associated with creation. Um, and so we find these dragon robes uh, used by the emperor. Um, only the emperor and his family were allowed to wear true dragon robes. And I mean, true, <clears throat> that's a long pao. Long is a dragon that has five claws. Um, so on uh, the one that you're looking at, um, that you see on the screen now, I think it has four claws. Um, and that's actually a, <clears throat> it's a mang pao. Mang is a python. Um, so by taking off one of the claws, um, it makes it actually okay um, uh, for someone who's not in the imperial family to wear. But you should actually be a very high-ranking person. 
Um, the embroidery on this is really incredible. Remember when we saw the, the petals of the flower, you said, oh, well, you just, I, you know, you see the ground fabric beneath them. But here, um, uh, between the various color motifs, you see couch gold thread. So in addition to silk embroidery, <clears throat> we're seeing what it is, is silk threads that are wrapped in gilt paper. Um, <clears throat> and so this gives this extra uh, reflectivity. Of course, these threads are very expensive. And so they're also um, communicating uh, the, the wealth, the power of the wearer. Wow, this is such an amazing piece. Now you can imagine all that thread, the gold, the metallic wrapped thread on there. This is a very heavy costume. In the opera, these would have been worn uh, with padding underneath to keep it off the body, to keep the sweat off. And um, in, in the early days, they even had bamboo vests so that the bamboo separated the, the silk from the body. Because once the, if you sweat on these, they, they could be damaged uh, and you can't use them again. Uh, so this extraordinary costume is a, for a high ranking civil male uh, official character. It could be a high minister, an emperor, a judge, or even an immortal. And that's something I haven't touched on yet is that in, in all of the operas, these costumes could be worn by humans or immortals. And just like the human realm where everybody has a, their rank, so do the gods in their world. So there's a mirroring going on. So this would have been, um, it could be a, a, a high official in the human realm or an immortal in the divine realm. It's, it could also be worn by a military man uh, who's not in battle. Uh, and you can see that there's a hoop belt that it would be worn with. That's again, to extend the, the space of the body on stage. And that belt could be manipulated in all different ways to show emotion or to mime a certain action. Uh, it would have been worn with a beard, uh, a headdress uh, and boots, a uh, platform boots likely to raise again the height of the body. Uh, like the phoenix uh, robe we saw, it's a microcosm of the universe, the dragon uh, representing heaven, the oceans representing earth, uh, and the dragon connecting, this, uh, uh, connecting um, in this middle space around this flaming pearl treasure that's asso associated with the dragon. And, so it's a quite an amazing piece. And then the one on the left here that you can see in the other camera has tighter sleeves and a different kind of collar that uh, would have been worn by a character playing a Manchu personality. So the Qing characters did make their way into these Beijing operas. Um, they were often the villains or the antagonists, <laughs> um, but they, they, the elements of Qing costume did appear. And here's a good example of that. Yeah, I'll point out really quickly, uh, this is a Manchu style um, and it uh, attaches with toggles. You can see these little knots and toggles um, and it creates this shape that goes down. Now in the Ming dynasty, they did not use those type of toggles. What you see on this robe, uh, in the Ming dynasty, the, uh, the neck is, um, it is closed here and it's done with ties. Um, and so the audience would have been very tuned in to these kind of uh, uh, visual um, uh, differences and uh, differences in, in tailoring. Um, so let's go on and look at this really spectacular costume. Um, and um, April will tell us a little bit more about uh, who, who would have been wearing this. Um, but this is armor. And so uh, we know that it would have been worn by um, a, a warrior. Um, Chinese ar armor has a very long history. Um, if you think about, you know, the terracotta warriors, you know, that we see from uh, the third century BC, um, that shows us the diversity of armor um, from that very early period. Um, in the opera, um, we're seeing um, costumes that are based on, you know, much later, um, much later uh, armor and ceremonial armor during the Ming and Qing dynasty. And I'm not talking what you wear onto the battlefield, but ceremonial armor um, often would be made out of silk and it would be very heavily padded silk and many layers of heavily padded silk um, with some like metal studs and metal uh, reinforcements. Um, but these, even a, a military officer um, wearing one of these ceremonial robes, the ceremonial robes uh, could be very heavily embroidered as well. Um, so these would have been uh, embroidered armor would have been worn by very high ranking people um, at the court. Um, on this one, we see a number of auspicious um, uh, um, animals. 
here we see a peacock. And of course, uh, peacocks associ associated with beauty, with nobility. There are a lot of uh, uh, symbolic associations with it. Uh, peacock was also the third ranked civil official. So it has those connotations as well. Um, interesting embroidery we see on the, um, the peacock tail. Um, how they created that was they took two colors of thread. They took green and white and then loosely twisted it together. Um, and then um, those are uh, laid down in satin stitches there. Um, and so it creates this kind of iridescence um, of a peacock feather. Um, if you look at the body of the peacock, there are these long satin stitches, um, but these other tiny stitches um, have been laid over the top of these um, to create uh, this pattern of the feathers. Um, that's not an easy, a quick or easy thing to do. Um, some other really great embroidery is on this fish um, that is on uh, this skirt panel. Um, and if you look at the head of the fish, for instance, you can see these different colors of blue, a very delicately embroidered and, uh, in long and short satin stitches so that it creates this um, shading effect um, that creates this, this um, beautiful shades of blue within this same motif. Now, if, if you think that dragon robe was heavy, this is this takes a lot of training just to wear this costume. Uh, it's this is the costume for the woman warrior, and um, it's probably one of the most elaborate op Beijing opera costume types there is, and alongside the male warrior costume. Now, the armor in the opera is called cow, so this is a cow full battle armor. Now, it has the four, four flags in the back. That indicates that this person is a status of a general, so a high ranking military general. There are, um, you could wear the battle armor without the flags, which means that you're a slightly lower rank. Uh, if you're wearing this costume, it means you're going to battle. So you would also be carrying your weapon. You would have your, your guards, your entourage. Those, uh, you know, those flags you see on either side say sun and moon, and they would have been carried into battle. Uh, it would have been worn with a large headdress. Now, what's interesting, the woman warrior in the opera had a particular performance where she actually would come out wearing these bound feet shoes, these imitation bound feet shoes. So on top of wearing this heavy costume, you're, on, you're basically on your tippy toes, <laughs> your heel is up, jammed up in the, the, the shoes, and there's this exquisite dance that is done uh, in those shoes. And that is one of the climatic parts of the opera. Um, so care, uh, one of the most famous woman warrior characters would have been Mu Guiying of the Yang family generals. Uh, so I encourage you to look into that and, and, and find out more about this incredible costume and the art of performing within them. All right, so this, um, we've looked at uh, the garments that we've prepared for you today and talked a little bit about them, but we do have time now for questions yeah. from the audience. Um, so, David, yeah. if you wanted to come back on yeah, and uh, let us know some of um, yeah. uh, the questions the audience has. So here's a question. Uh, if the threads are wrapped in gilt paper, how are costumes maintained over time? How often would one costume be used and, how, and for how many performances? Oh, that would be one for April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, the costumes are cared for, uh, there's actually in most troops, they had somebody just looking over costumes, a costume caretaker. And like I was saying earlier, they would have been, uh, these larger, more elaborate ones would have been worn with substantial padding and some material underneath to keep it off the body, to keep the sweat away. But other than that, there's really not, um, you know, there's not many ways to keep these costumes, you know, in pristine condition. They needed to be fixed. They needed to be replaced mm -hmm. regularly. <laughs> and also because of the fashion, the quick changing fashion of the opera, a lot of performers didn't want to wear the same uh, costume again. So they would have a new costume for their next performance. So um, in many cases, they didn't get too much use. Uh, and that's probably why we see these here. These might have been used a few times, but you can see they're in pretty good condition. I have two teenagers that have a similar uh, dressing pattern where they only want to wear it one time. Um, what is the relationship or influence uh, uh, of these costumes on the uh, Chipao dress uh, from the Qing Dynasty? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that the Chipao, I'm not sure of relationship with um, 
uh, with specifically with opera costume, but it does seem to come from uh, Manchu costume uh, in general. It was a progression um, from the late Qing. Um, so, but I can't, I don't know any direct connection that uh, with opera costumes specifically. Okay, so this is, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to add, add to that, that the Qi Pao, yes, you're, you're absolutely right, Lee. Um, the Qi Pao is a more of a modern uh, uh, type of dress that appeared much later than the Ming, obviously. But it's very interesting that in the early, early 20th century, in the 1920s and 30s, the Qi Pao was gradually incorporated into some operas, especially Cantonese opera, <laughs> uh, which was a little bit uh, more innovative and riskier in, in terms of what right. they came on stage. They, sometimes they even showed up in tuxedos. So it did play a role in the, in the modern um, Chinese operas. Um, so a couple people have requested for a close up of the uh, woman warrior's boots. So, um, Okay, and then yeah. um, how similar is the structure of the shoe to a platform shoe or a ballet toe shoe, or is there no similarity? So these shoes are um, probably not the shoes that would have been worn with this costume. Um, these look to me like uh, they probably should go with another costume, a non-martial costume, because they're flat. The martial costumes tended to have platform shoes, or as I was describing earlier, the bound feet shoes, which are have a very steep um, have a very steep uh, heel, uh, and the and the foot is at a, at an angle. Um, so I I don't think we have I haven't seen on display any of those. Um, we do have a pair here, <laughs> and I think this is what you were describing, April. Um, oh yes. Course, at this time, um, uh, women would not have bound their feet, but they wanted to give the appearance of bound feet. And so they very cleverly, uh, like April was explaining, designed these shoes that give, you have to sort of stand on your tiptoes and balance, uh, but it gives the, the, the appearance <laughs> of, of having bound feet without actually having uh, to deform yourself. In that way. <laughs> yes, those are the shoes for sure. And you can see that extra fabric that would have been pulled up around your calf and tied up with ropes so that it's really nice and tight on your foot. And you can see right behind those, those are the male platform shoes that would have been worn with um, the, the dragon ropes. And you can see that's, that's a very high shoe. That takes a lot of skill to be able to dance and do <laughs> fast maneuvers on stage, but it would have raised the height of the performers. Those are tall boots, and oftentimes they're embroidered as well, although th these ones are plain. All right, well, for those uh, coming to visit the uh, Golden Threads exhibit, we will, we will shuffle some shoes around <laughs> to be more accurate. Um, I'm assuming they're talking about the women warrior costume because of the size, but how many pounds does this weigh? And with headwear, what does that all mean in terms of the weight of the actors that they were carrying? That's a great question. The, the weight of the costumes has definitely gotten lighter over time. They used to be a lot heavier when they put like brass and mirrors on it and they used different kinds of materials. Um, in fact, bamboo was used a lot for earlier costumes because it was such a lightweight wood, but still very strong. Uh, I think the newer costumes, because now they use plastic, they use different, it's a bit lighter, but all in all, it could be between 20 and 30 pounds altogether including you know the, the flags and everything so and I also forgot to mention the headdress for this is often worn with the uh, pheasant feathers uh, and there's a whole industry of pheasant feathers for the opera uh, that would have again been used to telegraph movements from far away so just a flick of the head could indicate a certain emotion uh, you know it, it's amazing how the performers master the twitching of the, the head feathers <laughs> um. So, um, how do they make the designs on the costume and shoes? Do they use a template for the design or are they doing it by just by visually looking at it or, or something else? That's, that's a great question. Um, me probably knows more about how they do that in, for real clothing. I've been in opera workshops where they have, they draw it out on paper, sometimes tracing paper. 
um, and they, they draw out all the patterns and they embroider uh, a lot of the fabric first before they sew it. Um, and it is a transfer process, sometimes using a, a kind of chalk where they transfer the drawings uh, loosely onto the fabric before they start to embroider. And then the, the, the chalk is just dusted off when you're done. Um, I've also seen them do some light uh, line drawings on the fabric as well before they start to embroider. But I think there's quite different techniques uh, that can come into play depending on the type of stitch you're do doing. And also some of the costumes, as you can see here with the peacock have padded elements, uh, almost like sculpted elements that are on top of the fabric. So if you're sculpting a form, I think there's a, a bit of a different process as well. That's right. I can't speak directly as you do to um, uh, opera embroidery, but I do know about embroidery for costume, which is certainly um, the, the, the technique is very similar. And yes, these are very detailed designs. You certainly don't want to make a mistake. And so you're always going to have the design put onto the fabric before you start uh, embroidering it. And so, um, like you said, they generally these, you know, could be done from a template. It could be an artist that has drawn it onto a piece of paper. I've seen them, you know, like uh, often we do in the West too, for transferring, you might punch little holes um, in the pattern and then put like a chalk, like April was talking about. So you do a pounce pattern um, onto the fabric. Uh, but sometimes I've actually even seen um, artists just get a brush and actually paint uh, lightly uh, 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 a design onto the silk um, and then that's uh, embroidered on top. For some of the ones that are uh, more heavily padded, you might actually get a, um, a, a design template, put it on <coughs> the fabric and then embroider right over the paper. Um, and that gives some sort of stiffness to the pattern and it also creates some sort of dimensionality as well. Um, but to get sort of the raised part that you see um, on the uh, peacock body, for instance, um, that probably would have been created with putting cotton padding on there to create, uh, to create the sculptural effect. Traditionally, would only men perform in these operas? And how about today? Can women perform? Can women perform in its roles? What a great question. Yes. So back in the day in the Qing dynasty, there were prohibitions against women performing in the opera. And so it became common for men to perform the female roles. And a great example is the very famous performer Mei Lan Fang, who specialized in the dan, the female roles. Um, However, in the early 20th century, around uh, the time of the, 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 the shifting in, in politics, the fall of the Qing dynasty and this, the, the Republic of China taking shape and the women's um, movement, gradually female uh, troops were formed. And first all female troops and then both female male troops were formed. So by the 20s and 30s, there was the females on stage. And of course, today, many, many females are performing in Beijing opera. I think we have just time for one more question. A um, couple people have asked about uh, the embroidery techniques. You know, how have they changed? Are they uh, embroidered today by machine versus by hand, or is it is it all hand embroidery? Or well, April might be able to speak a little more about what they're doing today. But just from examination of the ones that I see here, um, these is, these are hand embroidery. Um, these are very, very finely done. Um, and uh, one might expect, for example, like it's on the stage, it's far away, people are gonna be so close, really, you have to be so careful. No, there's actually a lot of time, effort and skill um, that goes into the creation of these embroideries. So what we've been looking at today um, is all hand embroidery. And these techniques really uh, go back centuries. Um, we see, for example, satin stitch, gold couching, um, the, the counted stitch that we looked at, at, at on the rank badge. Um, those have been around unchanged um, for many, many hundreds of years. Right. Yeah, they're still, they're still making them by hand. <laughs> Machines yeah, are also used, but the hand, the hand craft is still there. <laughs> so we are putting up a slide uh, that has a lot of information on it, but don't worry, uh, if you've registered for this event, uh, we will email this information to you. And um, also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the um, 
the uh, event, the recording of the event is uh, will be on our YouTube channel usually in a day or so. So um, I want to um, thank everybody for joining us, uh, April Liu and Lee Talbot, and special thank you to ARP Maryland for sponsoring this program. And also thank you to uh, Louisa Sorkness, our program coordinator, and Shin Ren, our operations manager, who today are camera women. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if you'd like to share this discussion with a friend or watch it again, as I mentioned, it's on our YouTube channel and, um, and, uh, and all the information will be, will be passed on. Uh, um, April, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, how people can get to your book? Yes, it's actually, it's actually on Amazon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also, you can order directly from the publisher, Figure One in Vancouver, BC. And there you'll learn a lot more about the costumes and all the questions that uh, we haven't had a chance to answer. You'll probably find the answer in my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. And Lee, uh, you, uh, tell us about the, the upcoming uh, exhibit uh, at the Textile Museum. Uh, that's right. Opening on January 22nd, 2022 will be a blockbuster exhibition called Indian Textiles, A Thousand Years of Art and Design. So as implied by the title, we're looking at a thousand years of creativity and textile art on the Indian subcontinent. Um, so everyone, please come and see it if you're in DC. If not, you can find the catalog available online. You can go to our museum bookshop um, and the catalog is available now. Terrific. Well, um, Golden, our, our exhibit, Golden Threads, ends on the same day that your exhibit opens. So when people come, we will redirect them down the road. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really terrific. And uh, we're, so, we're so blessed to, to have you both uh, and your expertise here this evening. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Take care.